All right. Thank you for your time today, guys. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, this is a, a quite important uh, topic that we really wanted to have its own separate webinar for. And I know if you've been a part of a few other webinars, uh, this topic has come up. Uh, and I'm going to go through it in a bit more detail and just so we have, all have a very clear understanding of it. This will be recorded for future use as well uh, for all the people that you know this comes up in the future, for them to be able to have the opportunity to, to review it as well. So uh, there will be a, a bit that's repeated, and and I will say this is a much shorter uh, shorter presentation, but it's it's just a critical point that we really wanted to emphasize on. And then at this point, and in the future, we may have opportunities to emphasize more about it and use more case examples and whatnot. So let's get straight into it. So a quick overview of what's going to be happening today. So we're going to go about a GAMP, well, about GAMP, who we are and what we do. The assessment process, uh, wind calculations and fixings, so the different types of roof sheets, whether it's penetrated or concealed, and uh, roof sheet testing. And lastly, uh, questions and answers. So I, would, I really encourage you to write questions in this. It's not a very um, well-known topic, so I'm sure there's going to be plenty of questions that we can learn from each other. If you're thinking it, there's a good chance someone else is as well. So please write it down and we'll go through it together at the end. So about GAMCorp, you know, GAMCorp's a structural engineering firm that is um, has been effectively servicing the commercial solar industry for the past decade. Uh, we do do uh, help with other parts of other industries like um, steel fabrication and playgrounds and bridges and whatnot. But our main uh, space is the commercial solar space in both ground mounted and roof mounted. And we also have been in recent times doing something called roof sheet testing, which we'll go through in more detail uh, in this presentation. And we've been fortunate enough to be part of some of the biggest projects, learning a lot about um, how these large-scale commercial solar projects uh, are done and, and the different uh, you know, uh, challenges that come when, when trying to install quite major projects, but we all the way down to you know, smaller residential style uh, designs and certifications as well. So the assessment process is broken into three parts. Right? The first part is holds the biggest weight, which is the structural assessment. Uh, which is effectively the members and beams that make up the, the the capacity of your structure. And the second part is the fixing assessment, which is what we're going to be talking about today predominantly. So we spent a bit of time, a couple of webinars about the, the structural assessment, uh, but now we're going to be focusing a lot more on this element, a fixing assessment, and understanding why this can be such a problem with so many certification uh, processes and last, lastly, the array frame check is about a 10% component, which makes sure the suitability for that array frame for that site, uh, and, and we certify that as well. So that's the general process. Today's focus is on this part, which we really haven't tackled much, but um, we have had a couple of slides on it in the past. So wind calculations and components. So this is the focus on fixing. When we talk, we're talking about fixing, we're talking about the direct support between uh, the building and your array frame, which is in many cases either a screw or a clamp. Um, so we know the standard L feet and screw systems that we will touch on that, but that's not the main concern here. The main concern is clamps. The clamps, clamps differ on every type of roof sheet. And we're understanding now when we're doing these wind calculations, there's a range of factors that come in, there's a range of factors that come into play uh, that once we analyze, we can effectively spit out a, a, a pressure, pressure map on your roof to see where the different pressures are on the different sections of your building. In the corner zone, you get two directional wind forces. Uh, so that's why these corner zones are quite large in force. And then on the edge zone, you have the direct impact on the wind along the whole wall. Uh, and then across that edge face, you find a quite high impact of wind pressure. Then a, a small fraction after that is also an intermediate zone, which also has a higher wind pressure. And then lastly, the internal zone, which is the least wind pressure of all the, of all the four zones. Now, it is dependent on what type of roof you have. Uh, so if we have a standard pitched roof that's less than 10 degrees, you, you would have seen this probably predominantly if you've, you've used our report in the past. So that's probably the most common kind of structure. Then you have this kind of system. Now, if it's greater than 10 degrees, then the ridge line becomes its own effective uh, edge zone, and it, and it, it plays a lot, more, a lot more of a critical part of the assessment. And the internal zone is a lot smaller. So when you have a greater than 10 degree roof, understand the wind pressures act very differently to a standard kind of roof. And then lastly, your flat roofs, whether it's less than 10 degrees or more than 10 degrees, very similar in its book. Uh, if it's more than 10 degrees, it gets away, gets rid of the corner zones, but it effectively becomes a quite a large, big corner zone. Uh, but it just becomes a significant edge zone and an intermediate zone. And these calculations and pressures are calculated from both site factors, 
and on factors of your insulation, whether it's flush or tilt or whatever it is in that sense. So uh, understanding that uh, these, these do change and we, we went through in the sales presentation how you can actually calculate this and we have a calculator for you guys to use uh, to understand you know the different distances when you're actually initially designing your PV layout. So let's get into fixing spacing. So there's a, there's a common understanding that a lot of times people say why is there so many clamps? You know sometimes when you're installing in parallel which means that your clamps are in parallel to your purlins um, I should say your, your rails and your clamps are in parallel to your purlins then sometimes the wind pressure is so high that you need to increase the amount of clamp feet you have uh, for the insulation. The reason you increase the amount of clamp feet is if there's a certain pressure of, let's say it's 10 kilonewtons upwards and each clamp is giving you only one kPa in resistance then you need to have 10 clamps in that space in that square meter or in that space to accommodate for that uplift pressure. Now usually that's not the case but how we identify it now is say we said there's different color zones whether it's a corner zone a you know an edge zone or an intermediate zone or an internal zone the correlating zones have a correlating space fit, fixing space for your feet. So in the internal zone uh, in this particular example you see that the you could you have 1600 spacing between your clamps which means it's a clamp every 1600 uh, millimeters and then once you get to to this red edge zone which is sorry I should say the yellow edge zone you start seeing that the fixing spacing has to be reduced to accommodate for the additional pressures now there's been some cases that we've had to go you know lower than 500 millimeters per leg because the roof sheet type itself is quite weak and we really need to make sure there's more clamps on that roof to accommodate for the you know greater wind pressure so understanding now when we see why there is more clamps in certain areas than others now we know why right because there's the wind pressure differs on the building and to accommodate for these different wind pressures you need more feet on the ground to hold it down right now roof sheet types two main two main types of roof sheet types one is oh, i would like to put an overarching umbrella on the two types one is penetrated roof sheets which is effectively uh, any roof sheet that it requires screws to hold the roof sheet down to the structure and the screws that you can see going on top of the roof sheet through the roof sheet Right, the main two are corrugated and trim deck. Um, you, you would have seen them plenty on different sides. We'll go into that in the next slide. And then concealed roof sheets is the second umbrella, which is like your clip locks, your long lines, and your different types of clip locks and, and whatever it is. So we'll go in a bit more in detail that as well. Just want to identify two main types who are looking at screwed roof sheets or in like concealed and you can't see the screws, but they are underneath, but you can't see the screws when you're walking over the top of the building. So firstly, penetrated roof sheets. Penetrated roof sheets are uh, usually got you know quite a high capacity because the the strength of that roof sheet is dependent on the screw and it being penetrated into the the, material, the structural material which in this case in this image is timber. Now the greater this screw goes into that timber, the greater the force you have in regards to its uplift calculus, like its uplift pressure um, contribution. But if you are screwing into something that's quite thin like a very thin steel z section which is only you know let's say one millimeter thick then even in that whole screw there's only one millimeter of that screw being used uh, and and that's at the point of when it's passing through that pearl then so it becomes quite a weak connection so in general i wanted to raise that roof sheet uh, corrugated roof sheet and trim deck roof sheet types are great for solar obviously i'm not talking about the water leaking issues and other issues that come with it but uh, in regards to structural capacity they're great for the capacity they give the major concern with them is the is the fact that sometimes when we screw into it and it goes into a top hat which can be you know as as, as thin as point one of a uh, sorry 0.5 of a millimeter and then your capacity is still in question there so although it's very good and very positive please don't don't think it's the best for all cases it's only really good when you have you know a decent sized thick perlin uh, steel perlin or in every case when you're putting in it's a timber because you can get some good penetration which capacity is quite good all right now what we're here to talk about and more than anything else is the concealed roof sheet now we've gone through this particular slide before but we'll go into some more detail after this slide but just giving general overarching view of why concealed roof sheets are so dangerous is uh, a good example is this case here so you have two types of roof sheets here both provided by the same manufacturer uh, you have the fielders uh, king clip 700 and you have the fielders hit clip now different difference within in sorry different widths for both the sheets one is 
2700, one is 630. Uh, but in general, uh, the, the use of this is, this is one of the more cheaper options that Fielders has, and this is one of the more expensive options that Fielders has. Now, looking at how they work is effectively this roof sheet uh, is, is pushed down onto a clip that is screwed into the structure. So you have a range of clips, they're all screwed into the structure, and then this roof sheet comes down on top and is placed down over the top of it. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, in this case, you have the same kind of clip, but it's being screwed down, but it's interlapping and tying into the whole roof sheet structure. But in this case, it's just really being pressed over this clip, and the only thing really holding it down is the friction between metal and metal there. So the uplift capacity, this is quite low, you know, it could be as small as 0 0.8 kilonewtons, whereas the capacity of this, where it's interlocked and held down and, and wrapped into the other part of the rib, uh, it has a much higher capacity, and closer to, you know, double or triple that amount. So the point is that, if you're going on a site and you're seeing that it's a concealed roof sheet, it's very hard for us and very hard for you to identify what this what this system inside is for this roof sheet. Unless we can see clear distinguishing signs about the roof sheet, whether it's high strength that has horizontal lines through here or other factors on other roof sheets, it's hard to say this is the exact roof sheet and GAMCORP used these computations. And if we don't know what it is, and we know it's a 700 pan roof sheet with, sorry, 700 wide sheet with a rib, um, with rib details of a standard 700. And we have to assume that it is a field because we have no other understanding of it. So lifting up the roof sheet and getting the photo of this clip can be an important part to help us understand and identify the roof sheet. I know we've gone through this a few times, so I really want to push it one more time um, for everyone to have a good understanding. So this, this can most commonly be the weakest part of the system. It doesn't matter how amazing your structure is under this roof sheet. It could be you know, quite magnificent and it has you know, quite big steel purlins and, and all the rest of it. But if your roof sheet on top is quite weak and your clamps are going on top of that roof sheet, then at the point of a massive gust of wind, you're gonna see that clamp very easily pick up that roof sheet and that roof sheet come off its internal clip. Right, and that's a, disl a panel dislodgement. That when we've seen cases of that in Australia, and we've helped with situations like that in Australia as well. Uh, it does happen, especially in the higher wind region areas along the coast, along Queensland and WA. And this, an example of why this is only available in WA is because they've understood different wind pressures in WA and they've made something you know, to accommodate for that. Let's get on to the next slide. So one thing that we talked about with Clenergy and then I asked them, I had a chat with them before doing this project. So what's, what's the frustration you guys have with, you know, the, the clamps and different understandings? And this is a really good one and I really want to address it. This is a really simple case of two sheets that look more or less the exact same from an overarching image, but understanding how they differ. So on the left here, you have, uh, you know, you have a clip lock for a six and on the right, you have a clip lock 700. Although they look more or less the exact same when you're on the side, uh, they have very different clips. And not only do they have very different clips, they have slightly different uh, ribs as well, right? Very slight, but they are, it is quite apparent, especially for us. Um, and what we found is a lot of people will say, they would just give us a checklist that says, it's a clip lock roof sheet. So well, that, that's great and it's helpful that we know the profile is a clip lock roof sheet, but there is so much more detail than we need than just whether it's a clip lock or you know, a long line roof sheet. We need to know, you know the width of the pan because the width of the pan can affect the clamp you use. So here you've got a case where there is a slight difference, whereas the 406 uses the ERI32, whereas the 700 uses the ERI09. And this is one that kind of just, you know, they've, uh, there will be an installation, they've ordered, you know, a bunch of these because they were under the pressure that's clip lock. And then after some time and getting on site, it just doesn't fit properly and it's just not the capacity that they need. It's just not tightening enough. And they realized halfway through the project they, they needed a 406 clamp the ER I32. So very important to understand that not only now for the 406 and 700, sure, this clamp will work with most other 700 roof sheets, but there's many different types of 700s as well. And their capacity has definitely changed depending on you know the, the manufacturer that has it. You have the clip block fielders that has that we went through in the last slide that has 0.8. You have the, the high strength that has closer to the high twos, and then you have the speed deck ultra that has um, sorry, the, the high strength that has the, the high one, so 1.8, 1.9, and then you have the speed deck ultra that has that 2.3, 2.4. Uh, so definitely, especially identifying this clamp, you know, they're both they don't sit 
the, the same way on that roof sheet. So the first thing I would do is when you get on a sheet and you see that it's a clip lock profile, just me measure the width of that sheet and understand which clamps you should be using. If it's a four or six, jump on the ER I32. If it's 700 uh, and vice versa and so on and so forth. All right, narrow roof sheet types. Uh, so this one's one that's been a problem for us. Uh, now, we, we kind of understood in the previous comment about uh, the field is only really relying on friction between metal and metal, right? And, and this is another case where these clamps don't have a interlocking system. They, they, they do to a certain extent, but not as, not as penetrative as you would uh, a lot of times like. So this is an example of a long line three or five roof sheet and understanding how, you know, what Clenergy and S, S5 have done in this case to this S5 Mini use uh, the S5U and the S5U Mini, uh, what they've done to identify, like, test and identify how to connect to this kind of uh, narrow ribbed roof sheet. Now, the in the Clenergy case, you can see that they've got a, they've got a rubber internal that obviously provides an extra amount of friction, and these bolts that go through and tighten as, as you know as tight as possible. That has been tested significantly, right? From MT, like from from NADA testing service labs, they they've done multiple tests to see what's the capacity once it's at its full, you know, torque and whatever it is of the uplift of this clamp, and then of the sheet. Now, the reason I bring this up is because usually in the previous case we talked about that clip being the failure point, right? But what we found with clamps like this is and and with sheets like this, I should say. Is that when we're testing these on sites, at times it could be the clamp that fails before the clip fails, right? So the friction between the rubber and the and the sheet is in certain spaces, uh, in certain roof sheets, less than the fixing of the clip and the roof sheet itself. So understanding our, our learning from the testing from this is that not only not it's not always the clip that fails, it is at times the clamp that fails. But it's important to understand that they've done significant testing to make sure that there is a almost a you know a stand a minimized standard that can be used for successful structural assessments and certification and for your installations. So the testing that they do, uh, you know, ranges from up pulling going directly up, horizontal pullings, and and it's multiple times, and it creates a chart, and we use the the values to actually provide general certifications for the clams. Uh, I'm quite sure we're a part of the certification of both these clams. Uh, and, and there's always improvements that they're looking at in different types of mechanisms and different types of clamps. They're kind of introducing uh, like universal clamps and, and whatnot to help use to, to help use for for roof sheet types like long line three or five. Because there's, there's more and more of these coming around. There's not it's not just the three long line three or five. There's other roof sheets that have quite narrow uh, rib, ribs as well. Clam manufacturers. As I mentioned before, there's a, there's a range of them, and I don't want anyone to think that there's only one that we work with. We work with all the different types of clamp manufacturers, and we've helped being a part of the certification process of, you know, whether it be their tile hooks or their clamps or their L feet or whatever it is. Um, we just, I, as a, from GAMCO, it's a big thank you for all the efforts that these manufacturers in particular that we work with over the last decade uh, have done to make sure that they're doing the right thing by the industry. Uh, and they've, they're really taking the extra time and measure to make sure all their clamps have been tested correctly according to you know different types of roof sheets uh, and and we we just want to give just a big thank you to all the work that they've done to make to help the industry understand how these clamps work on roof sheets and this is a, a small example of a, you know one one particular clamp on a 700 sheet uh, how it, the clip is actually pushing this rib under this little uh, internal clip uh, and this is you know the common images like this from when they're testing and seeing how the failures are happening and, and what kind of failures are happening it helps us understand um, a lot of the, the clamps. So they've been a big part of our development and understanding how these clamps work. And as I mentioned before, you know there's there's clamps now coming out for these like Kingspan kind of roof sheets. There's you know universal clamps coming out that will help across all different types of you know rib profiles. Um, if there's any additional information you want on you know the different things that are coming out feel free to contact us with what we can share we definitely will um and you know some of these in these cases as well are a penetrative solution like in this in, in this case i'm not talking about concealed roof sheets here i'm just talking about the general great efforts that they have in doing the work that they do uh, there's a big appreciation for what they do now roof sheet testing 
Proof sheet testing is something that we introduced a couple of years ago, and effectively it it looks like it used to look, I should say, like the system you can see on the right there. So this was the first kit that we made, and we we did, we got this uh, concept and understanding from testing companies themselves, and to understand what the safest practice is to test proof sheets. Um, and, and the actual methodologies and how we test them is done from uh, the, that our principles kind of uh, put together for us. And effectively how it works, it's, it's quite a simple process. Uh, it's simple in its, uh, in its act, but it's very uh, accurate in its results. So what it is, it's, it's, it's a tripod of some sort, and I'll show you the new tripod we have, uh, sorry, the new like test kit we have in the next slide. But in our original case, it's a tripod that has feet that are not touching that current sheet. So there's no downwards force on that sheet that's being uh, tested. It's, in, it's being tested in an absolute isolated situation. We have a chain that comes from a winch. It goes up, uh, has a central force down to the clamp. The clamp is connected with the correct amount of torsion. And then there's a reader in Musa's hand, you can see here, that when he winches up the, the winch, it applies an uplift pressure onto the clamp. As this uplift pressure gets greater and greater and greater, this result will show us a certain amount of kilonewton capacity that that clamp can effectively take. Now we've got usually two people on here, and in this case for this photo of us, we to do both jobs, but one person is usually holding the winch, the other person is usually holding the reader and the camera to record the whole process. And the aim of this is to understand what's gonna fail first. Is it one, gonna be the internal clip, or is it two, going to be the clamp itself? Now, well before it actually gets to a point of defamation, if we get the values that we need and the results we need in capacity, we don't continue doing the testing. We understand that this clip and this clamp is as good as, let's say, a high strength or something, a, you know, quite a good roof sheet. And then we say, yep, we've got the results we need to perform the assessment. We're not going to, we're not going to um, continue that. Now, once we've done that one part, it may be just an unlapped section, which means it's like a central part of the roof. Uh, then we'll move and then test a lapped part. And lapping and unlapped sections of a roof sheet um, can have different different results in its structural capacity. So we do three tests on each section, whether it's lapped or unlapped, in different locations of the roof. Usually about two or three at a three, like two at a minimum, but usually around three. So why do we do it? We do it for three main reasons. Because you don't know what the roof sheet type is, it's a very common one, right? We know it's a clip lock 700, we've looked up, we've opened up the sheet, and we've never seen that clip before. And, they, and the clients are like, mate, we need to install quite a lot of panels on this and we want to know the exact fixing of this. So we take the kit onto the roof and we do this test and we know that now we know the exact capacity of their specific roof sheet on their site. The next one is if it's a new type of clamp. So we've come across a lot of unknown roof sheet types and you know companies have had to actually make their own clamps and or, or you know engage with a, a professional manufacturer to make their own clamps. So then they'll bring us that clamp and say, Santa, I've got a new clamp and I've got a roof sheet that I don't know what it is. Uh, can you help us part of the first the design and development process of a clamp, which we do? And then after that point, can you tell us, you know, the methodology you would like us to test it with and do the testing? So then we get the new clamp. And this happened on like quite big old shopping centers. We've had to we've had to wait, you know, five, six months for a clamp to come in to then actually get it out on site and test that clamp. And the first time it might not work, and it goes back to the developers of the, the manufacturers and say, hey, we need more rubber here. We need more, you know, bolt strength here or whatever it is. Um, so that's, that's, a, that's, I would say it's probably an uncommon one, but it is something that can happen and can be required if, if you do need it. And lastly, uh, sometimes they just want the best spacing as possible. So, right, we've done, a, we've done a massive installation on a huge building and the spacings come out, like we discussed earlier, at 1.6, sorry, I would say, sorry, 600 millimeters each clamp feet under the rail. And the client's like, mate, that's going to cost us just way too much for the amount of panels we want to put down. You know, there's, you know, there's you know, a megawatt going on here. It's just in clamps alone, it's too much. And then we explain why. We explain it's an unknown type of roof sheet. And because of that, it works. Like you can install, but there's, the fixing is unknown. So then we say by going out on site and by actually performing this roof sheet testing, which is a fraction of the cost compared to how much the clamps are going to cost, um, that way you'll know the exact fixing capacity of your clamp on that roof. And you'll be able to identify uh, the, like the greater spacing amount, or the maximum, I would say, the most efficient spacing amount for your clamps. All right, so again, going over quickly, procedure-wise, we test lapped ribs and, and unlapped ribs, and we test them along the intersections of pearl limbs. There's very little capacity in a 0.48 millimeter roof sheet by itself. It needs to be at the point where it's actually being secured by a pearl limb. 
uh, at the point that it's not being secured by a purlin, you're really, really relying on half a millimeter of steel to to be the support of your, you know, very expensive and, and new solar system. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't usually uh, ever really recommend off purlin installations. But there are some people that do recommend off purlin installations, and that's fine. And we do three three tests um, for each location and multiple places around the roof. Now. What we're moving towards is having a test kit in every state. I think we have two and a half right now, one in one in Victoria, one in Queensland, and there's one partly and nearly complete in uh, New South Wales. And what the reason for this is that, you know, a lot of people working with us over the last decade have found the importance of roof sheet testing and they found its benefit. So they've, they've asked us to be a part of their a part of their process long term to say, hey, if we can get a kit here and you can teach us how to use it and you can do it for us even, or if we can do it for you, uh, you know, what, what can we do around, about making you know, the best possible fixings for all outcomes? So they've actually put together a kit and the second one's on its way uh, to being completed for their, all the, I wouldn't say all the projects, but all the projects that have these, these concerns, whether it's online clamp or they want the best possible spacing. Uh, what it looks like is like this. It's quite a small, quite cute little system we have now. Uh, it's it's a very simple thing, and it took me about an hour at Bunnings to talk with a few of the Bunnings guys. God bless them; they're always so helpful uh, to to come up with it. And it effectively does the same thing that the big, massive, you know, 60 kilogram tripod that used to break up back when we we're trying to get it onto a roof. Now is a is a very small and cute, about 20 kilograms, if not less, uh, winch and um, sawhorse kind of system. So what we've done here is a very simply, we've replaced the, the massive tripod with you know a, a, quite a small little sawhorse. Uh, we've calculated the deflection with a F17 structural timber beam uh, at the size of the sawhorse, which I believe is a 90 by 45, uh, the inlet, I should say. And it, it doubled in that central section and the connection being a single uh, has enough deflection to allow this to test for up to about three kilonewtons with no with no deflection issues internally on the timber. So effectively, you've got a little little winch. It's a 500 kilogram winch. Uh, it is the, the the chain is put through that timber, so it's an exact central load like the tripod would be. So you just make a little insert um, and and wheel the thread through that, uh, and then it goes down to a force gauge reader. A force gauge reader is effectively it looks like this. It's a piece, I believe it works with magnets, but it's a, it's a reader that when you pull on both sides, this understands even to the, to the absolute millimeter of force that's being exerted and onto whatever you're pulling up. So this, in this case, you know, this goes down, chain goes through, it's got the force gauge reader, which goes to a little threaded bolt. That threaded bolt is connected to any type of clamp you want to test. Uh, that clamp is put onto a particular rail, and then you slowly, very, very slowly, winch this up. And as you wrench it up, you get a reading on the force gauge reader, and then you you look at the key identifying parts of the of the roof sheet, whether it's whether it's going to you know, if if it starts bending or if you start hearing noises of clicking or the clamp internal clip coming out of place or anything, you obviously stop at that point, uh, and you don't allow for you know any invasive uh, you know damage to the to the building itself as well. There's a few other bits and pieces to put together. Um, you know, this whole part of the system, not including this uh, force gauge, this system is about, I think, 80 bucks or so uh, at Bunnings. It's really not an expensive thing. Uh, and this, this, this is where the cost is, but it's still not an expense. It's not a ridiculous cost, but depending on the quality of the force gauge reader, the, the one we recommend, I believe, is around the $700 mark, but I can, I can confirm that we are looking to getting a bit of a cheaper one as well. But long story short, this is the kit. And this is the kit that we ideally want in every state. Uh, we want it in every state. We want a good solar team to take responsibility for doing it uh, to, for, for their own projects and then potentially for other projects if that's something that they're interested in doing for other people as well. But understanding how roof sheets work is critical to the point that we wanted to make it something that can be nationwide, something that can be easily accessible and easily be able to perform the, the task as well. And this is the best that we can come up with in regards to making it light, uh, you know, nimble in its, in its, in its manner and, and making sure that it's at a reasonable price point as well. Guys, that's pretty much it. Let's go through the summary of that. So we went through wind calculations, understanding the zones. The zones of a building, why clamps are, you know, more clamps are needed in certain areas, less clamps are needed in other areas. 
uh, whether the roof sheet type is penetrative. The one key point I want to bring out of penetrative, which is that screw type roof sheet, is that the negative only applies really when you are screwing to quite a thin roof sheet. So if it is a thin roof sheet, uh, sorry, <laughs> sorry, a thin steel purlin. If it is a thin steel purlin, like a Z200 1.2 or a Z200 one millimeter, then you really, doesn't matter how long and great your screw is, you're only really getting one millimeter of penetration through that steel. The second is the concealed roof sheet that we went through in this. Again, many different ranges of, of roof sheets. The, the main identifying point is that um, understand that the manufacturers have done everything they can to test for the different types of roof sheets. Uh, and if we don't know what type of roof sheet it is, we have to assume the worst case, which is that field that we talked about um, in regards to the 700 clip logs. Uh, but as I said, again, I don't want to talk too bad on filters. Filters have some amazing products as well. It's the builders that decide to use uh, the Fielder 700, not Fielders themselves. Um, and lastly, the roof sheet testing kits. Uh, you know, we, why we do roof sheet testing, the, the great results we're getting from roof sheet testing, whether it's, you know, using new clamps or, uh, you know, utilize, uh, making the best efficient spacings or whatever it is. And the, the challenge and the goal to get more people involved in roof sheet testing. Right now we have two companies and they all say that the more of the big players in the solar industry um, and, and they've committed to it and now you know if there's anyone else that wants to commit to it as well feel free to come along with us and, and go for the ride now we're going to go on next slide which is the Q&A uh, commonly asked questions so what I'll do is I'll, I'll go through these but at the same time I'd really encourage you guys again to ask questions this has been a quite short I think it's about halfway yeah, it's half the other presentation, we've been 30 minutes. So please feel free to ask some questions and, and use some time. And, and as well, if you obviously feel free to, to yeah, to, to, to join along or, or to leave whatever it is that you need to do. But let's go to the most commonly asked questions and we'll go through your questions. I see that there is about four or five questions right now, which is great. Uh, one is, what is the most common problem you face with concealed roof sheet types? Um, the two that we've faced uh, is clients not correctly identifying the roof sheets which causes confusion and reassessment. Uh, so when, when you say it's a clip lock 700, let's say hypothetically, and then we do the assessment based on clip lock 700, that has a certain capacity, right? And we said it's a, you know, a high strength. And then you know, a, a month later or a week later or two days later, after we've completed the assessment, we get told that it's actually a clip lock 406 or it's a clip lock 700 fielders, right? Or it's something that it wasn't initially told us. Not only now, does the certification results significantly change? Uh, but now your, your customers are expecting a certain result. And with this small change on understanding how this clip works can make something go from you know, significantly passing to now you know, your, your system size dropping by half, giving them corner zones, the wind pressure are too high. Uh, and the roof doesn't have the capacity and the clamp, there's not enough space for the clamp to put in. So that's a really common one, I would say please, First time, every time, try and get the roof sheet type exact. And if you don't know what it is, like I mentioned in the inspection uh, presentation webinar I did, uh, photos. Take as many photos as you want, right? The, the profile, the rib, the pan, the, the clip, more than more important than anything else, the clip. Like just take as many photos as you can to ensure that we can identify it first time and not have um, back and forth for your customer's sake. Uh, how long does the roof sheet take and what are the costs around that? So roof sheet testing requires two engineers and it takes up to two hours on site for one roof area. Uh, the cost of the assessment ranges depending on the number of uh, roofs that you want tested or the number of sheets you want tested. Uh, it is the first, the first lot is the bigger cost, which is 1500 that includes obviously travel plus two, two engineers doing the work. Uh, after that fact, if there's additional roofs, it's only a fraction of that. I believe it's uh, six or $700 on uh, additional for each roof because it takes into account a lot of our travel plus assessment and setting up and all that time required to do that. Uh, right now it's available in Victoria and we've been doing it quite successfully in Victoria. Uh, it's available and we're going to make it very soon readily available in New South Wales and Queensland. Uh, right now Queensland's probably the next one that's uh, ready to go. We have a team that's happy to do that for other people as well. Uh, do Gamco recommend any specific manufacturers for their clamp um, for their clamps? No, we don't work with any specific manufacturer or recommend any one manufacturer. Uh, there are you know positives that they have that we're not too involved with, which is you know their delivery and their cost and whatever it is. Uh, in regards to the main component that we care about, which is the structure elements, they're all very thorough with their testing and, and they're really and they're for the clamps that release in Australia and they all follow our guidance. They ask us, you know, what do we need to get tested? How do we need to get tested? We give them a methodology testing. 
and they all do a really great job in, in making sure that that's done correctly. So I can't say I recommend any one client. Um, I believe that in regards to everything that's done in the industry, they're all kind of being more innovative and all the manufacturers are doing their best to try and give you guys the best results possible. I think the advantages may be from your end, um, if there's pricing, the delivery and, and you know, service and elements like that is probably the identifying factor that you should be going for. But in regards to the clients, you should be you should be quite uh, you know comfortable knowing that they've done a great job in getting that port tested and done quite well. Uh, and lastly, can roof sheets damage the roof sheet? Uh, can roof sheet testing damage the roof sheet? And this is this is uh, you know probably the most common case that have, uh, is asked in every single every single time we quote one of these jobs or anything like that. Look, it is possible. It, there's always a there's always a percentage of um, there's always a percentage of damage or like a risk in potentially damaging something when you're doing testing on it. Uh, from the hundred plus tests, like physical tests that we've done. Uh, I think we had one case with a minor tear that was resolved with a bit of um, silicon. It wasn't a big deal at all, and it was done on the day that it happened or the day after. Uh, the point is that, is it a possibility? Yes, like anything else, it is a possibility. Um, but is it is it is it common? Very, very much not so. It's less than, I would say, 1% of the tests that we've done has caused any type of real damage to the roof. Uh, now, you would have as much damage, for the majority of the, the things you consider damage, you'd get more damage from walking over the roofs with a steel cap boot. Uh, it's really not any more different than you know pulling it up with your hands or anything like that. Uh, but the, if there is a really bad condition roof sheet, so if it's rusted or there's something internally that we don't know about, the clip internally has been rusted or faulty or something, then it can happen. There's many factors that can range to it happening. But in general, I would say no. Questions? Guys, thank you so much for your time. Let's run through a few of your questions together um, and then we will be on the way. So. Why are your tables showing clamp spacings shown as D, W, U, W, etc., and not corner edge? Mm. Give me one second. Do you mind if I review that? So I've got a question from Tim Weber why they're saying D, W, and U, W instead of, and I don't know what he means by that, so I just want to get an understanding of what he's saying by that. D, W, U, W. All right, Tim, I'm going to ask, I'm going to take this one offline with you. Uh, don't fully understand your question, but I'm being absolutely transparent, mate. Um, and I will, will hopefully get this one for you offline. But let's get back into the next question, if you don't mind. Uh, Tim, I'll ask you if you can to elaborate on your question. Uh, I'm thinking dead weight and, and ultimate weight. I'm, I'm not, it could be a range of things that DWUW could mean. All right, Chad, uh, what is the best way to safely remove a sheet to see what type of clamp is currently installed? Um, and the, the, that holds the roof sheet down. That's a really good question, Chad. Um, Chad, in, in many cases I'll say, and it's with respect to everyone in the industry, the job of lifting and, and putting down roof sheets and stuff is really the job of a plumber, right? Of a roof plumber in specific. Um, they are, they have the, 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 what's the word, the guarantees that when lifting and putting back down a roof sheet, that the water seals and everything will be tight and there'll be no damages done to the roof sheet. Uh, if I'm, if that's, the, that's the more correct answer I should be giving. Um, that's the more correct answer I should be giving, but the answer I will say is, uh, it's very simple. <laughs> and in saying all that, uh, it's, it's a very, very simple process, Chad. Uh, it's literally at any point where it's at the end of the end of the sheet, you can pick it up with a simple um, winch or uh, sorry, not a winch, I should say. Uh, a, uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? Oh my god! Any kind of piece of metal that you can kind of get in between that rib thing and jack it up, and then once you've got some kind of lift to hold onto, you literally just lift it up. It's really nothing to uh, you know. Uh, complex at all. You just really crowbar. That's it. That's what I wanted. A little crowbar to get it under the roof sheet to lift it up. Um, just be mindful that you need a, a few at different locations. You don't want to pin it at one point and lift it up because it can bend the roof sheet quite significantly. But uh, what I would say is before you go lifting up roof sheets when you're not too familiar with how to do it, um, engage a roof plumber to do it for your first time. Uh, and then after that point, once you see how quite easy it can be, then, then keep doing it for yourself. Tim Weber, I, I think I've understood the question now in regards to down. Uh, downwind and upwind. Your table is showing clamp spacing shown as downwind and upwind, etc., and not corner and edge. Um, it's it's 
I, I don't know if the tables are showing in that way. Uh, we, we calculate the wind in all different directions. Uh, and the, the dead load and the wind, or and the, I should say the upwind, um, are different calculations. We find the most critical and we give the table according to that. And then the spacings that are generated uh, are, are given according to the different zones. Uh, and each zone kind of has different wind fresh, uh, pressures from different directions. So the, the north face will have the north face wind pressures and we'll need a certain amount of fixing and then we find the most critical and give you that answer. I hope that answers it a little bit. Uh, why do you not measure deflection when you do the testing? Uh, when we, it's, it's very hard. Tim, Tim, another good question from Tim is why do you not measure the deflection when you're doing the roof sheet testing? It's very hard to accurately measure deflection. Uh, if you want to get an understanding, if you, when you're lifting up something, other parts of the things can also lift up. Um, if you had laser light deflection measurements, you could do different measurements in that sense. But it's very hard to get an accurate reading on the, the millimeter deflection is the first statement. The second statement is you don't know where the deflection is occurring. Uh, because you've only got the view from the, from the top, you don't know if it's the roof sheet that's being lifted off the, the clip. You don't know if it's the clip that's lifting up the pearl and it's lifting up the roof sheet. We don't know if it's the clamp moving up. It's, it's hard to understand at what point the different failures are occurring unless you had it in a section form where you could see it, which is what lab testing, a lot of the lab testing is doing. So it's very hard to get a full understanding of how the deflection is measured, uh, but we just, we understand that there's a failure point that we want to, sorry, there's a pressure that we want to get to, and we're looking at the identifying factors of the failure points that, uh, that, that it shouldn't reach to that point, if that makes sense. So. So once we've identified, we want a value of at least 2.3 for this site because the wind zones and the pressures and whatever it is need that. So when we go on site and we do that pressure, we look back at the preliminary, preliminary results and see we got 2.3. Now, if we get into 2.1 and we kind of see some failure, we just stop it there. So we're not too worried about the deflection level, it's plastic level, we're just more worried about whether it fails or it doesn't fail. Hope that kind of um, answers the question. Uh, another question for Tim. The new kits look as if the feet in the stand could be on the sheet under test. Yeah, really good question, Tim. So the feet, um, I'll, I'll just quickly show it. So Tim's concern is that uh, potentially when you're testing now, these feet will be able to stay on that, will be able to fit, sorry, will be putting force down onto that sheet. Um, and it's a really good question. We, we've, we've spaced this, the spacing here, it's a bit hard to see from a photo that doesn't have good, you know, any measurements on it. Um, this space here is about 450 in this, in this section, uh, and the legs exert out about 200 on each side. So you have about an 850 wide spread, right? Eight, at 850, you should be able to get to most roof sheets that are, you know, 406, 305, 700. Uh, so the sheets kind of end up something like about there and there, right? Which means that the legs aren't on the direct. Really, when I say direct, it will still play an effect here compared to there on the, on the next sheet. It's still providing a certain downward force, absolutely. But uh, the truth is we just want to know that real friction metal and metal thing, uh, like um, uh, capacity, and don't necessarily care about, and, and that clip, and that clip's going to be running usually along this section, and the sheet's going to be running here. So we have no foot on the clip, and we have no foot on the sheet. So that's what we're really happy about. But it's a really good question. Um, the kit does accommodate for that. Let's keep going. Tim Weber, full questions. Really good questions today, mate. Really appreciate your support and your, and your contribution and all this. Ivan Ross, would the new testing kit design apply downforce on the roof sheet as the legs are too far apart? Ivan Ross, you, I think Tim just beat you to it and it's a really good example of if. Um, if someone's thinking the question, there's probably another person thinking about it as well. So, uh, Ivan Ross, I think I believe I just answered that. But yes, um, we have accommodated for that the downward force. We believe we have, and, and for to a good certain extent as well. We've also done testing on both kits to see what kind of difference in results, and it's um, and it's really not that much different. It's more or less the exact same. Um, maybe standing on the roof sheet. Yeah, really good question again. Uh, Web uh, Tim again uh, is the person testing going to be standing on the roof sheet? Uh, we would like to hope that that person isn't standing on the roof sheet and, and, and knows that he shouldn't be standing on the roof sheet. Yeah, you can play, you can position yourself to not be standing on the roof sheet with that, with that testing kit. But all things are part of our, are part of our, um, uh, our team's guidelines that they have to do when they're testing, downwind and upwind. 
understood tim again with downwind and upwind we, we we're more, more concerned about the uplift and the upwind pressures um and in regards to directional it's it's dependent on the most critical whichever direction it is and then we go from there Chad, I'm an electrician, can I do this? Absolutely, Chad, we are running trainings on how to do roof sheet testing. Uh, you can definitely do it because this, this doesn't make this roof sheet, you know, NADA certified, right? We're not, looking at, uh, we're not looking at certifying roof sheet for as a product. We are looking at certifying your, uh, sorry, having a better understanding of the pressures of the roof sheet on your site for us to use in our, in our systems and in our calculations. We are happy to, as long as you've videoed the whole testing procedure and you've gone through our training, we're happy for you guys to, to, to perform the tests um, and perform for other companies as well, if you, if you like. We don't really mind at all. These are for our results to ensure that uh, we're giving you the best spacings and whatnot, and we use the calculations and we put our safety factors and everything on the results as well, don't get me wrong, to make sure that um, this is done. You don't need to be a testing, we're, like, we're not providing a, we're just doing, we're just getting more information for our computations directly for ourselves. Solar Gain WA would be interested in, in a kit. That's great. Well, Tim, we'll take that offline and uh, we'll, we'll definitely have a chat about that. Um, guys, I'm hoping a lot more people are interested about it as well. And, and, and you know, there's many kind of uh, companies, Solar Gain being one of them, that are kind of leading the way with a lot of the stuff that they do in regards to both in their structure engineering and in their, you know, their constant endeavors to, you know, improve their systems and, and processes to engage us in different manners to help uh, help them through their process. So um, thank you, Tim, and we'll, we'll take that offline. We'll give, definitely go into that a bit more. Guys, uh, I won't take any more of your time. Uh, thank you so much for your involvement today. Thank you so much for your questions. Uh, again, it is quite a complex thing, but it was quite a short and sweet thing. I really want you to take as much as you can from this and, and, and spread the word to other contractors about the problems that we're having with uh, roof sheets and and uh, how we can overcome them with a the different testing or whether it's just by identifying that clip more critically. Uh, please enjoy the rest of your weekend, uh, stay isolated, and, and uh, we'll hopefully see you sometime soon. We're going to be trying, looking at uh, running a few more webinars in the coming months. Uh, we'll keep you posted on you know, what the details of them are going to be. All right, guys, thank you again. Have a great weekend.